I was working the cabanas down in uh, the Deauville Hotel in uh, Miami Beach, Florida, and this uh, very scrawny um, Puerto Rican boy, about 17 years old, said, come on, Brian, come on, you come with me, we go surfing. Well, we went down to South Beach, which was a ghetto back then, and we caught waves that couldn't have been uh, thigh high at best. And when I stood up and I rode the wave, he said, you'll be hooked. And I was from that day afterwards. I came up here and I saw Bill Wise and uh, George Pittman walking down the boardwalk with surfboards under their arm, talked to them. They told me they were Hobie dealers. And uh, I gave them a $20 deposit on a brand new, uh, probably is about nine, eight Hobie. It was $120 for the board. Uh, it was $10 a week payments and they religiously came down from Harrington every weekend and extracted $10 from me for that surfboard. This first surf shop that I recall, of course, was Eastern Surfer. It was under the uh, Andy Hill Motel. Um, and of course, George Pittman and Bill Wise had it. And uh, John Robinson worked and hung out there, who nobody's ever heard from him since. Uh, Jeff Mubford, the son of the uh, Sandy Hill owner, um, he was a young surfer then, along with Bobby Church, his father owned the motel next door. We would hitchhike down here so that we could go surfing on the, on the weekends. Yeah. And just coming down Route 50, when you cross that bridge, you smell the salt air, you couldn't wait. That summer, um, people just started to come in from different areas that I met, guys from Baltimore, uh, my still good surfing buddy, Keith Campbell. Um, Skip Baumgartner, Dutch Wallvogel, guys that we don't even see anymore, but they were around in the beginning of surfing in Ocean City. Let me tell you about the shortboard craze. I was uh, selling condominiums up at Sea Colony, and on my way to Sea Colony, this guy had opened a surf shop in uh, Fenwick Island called Clearlight, Bill Helmuth, and um, I would always in a hurry but I pulled in there one morning and he was showing me these boards that were so much more maneuverable and everything so I bought a nice board from Bill Helmuth and unfortunately my work schedule really didn't let, lend it too much time to learn to surf it and on most unfortunately shortly thereafter it was stolen so my opportunity at getting in on the short boarding sort of went by me it was a Jim Overland board and it was probably about 6'10", something like that maybe, a little on the fat side. 1975, I had George Smith, who was building Bayside surfboards, build me a board that was 7'4", which was quite short, but we called it Fat Albert because it was, it was about three and a half inches thick. And I put that on my arm and on the airplane and I carried it out to the north shore of Oahu. And I paddled it out at sunset. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was about the shortest board I ever rode was a 7.4. My short board today that I've only surfed a couple times, but I've made up my mind at my age, I'm going to learn to surf a short board. So I'm going to work my way down. Uh, it's a very light epoxy um, Al Merrick 7.6. Uh, um, I do have a shorter board I've never been able to ride. It's 6'10", um, but by the end of the summer, um, I believe I'll be riding that board. I've always been uh, a bit of an inventor, and um, most recently, uh, I've had this idea for about four or five years uh, because I've been active in sailing and the design of hulls and water resistance and what works, what planes, and what doesn't. So I got Randy Rarick to build a prototype surfboard that is rather bizarre. Um, and he laughed at first, and then as he got into shaping it, he started calling me and said, hey, Brian, he said, guys are coming in this shaping room and looking at this thing, and they think it's pretty cool. And then more phone calls came. So I designed a board like you've never seen. And um, I'm testing it right now. It um, has, it definitely has a lot of merit and um, I'm going to have some more accomplished surfers than I ride the board. Uh, Bill Helmuth is my first choice because he surfs both long boards and short boards. This board is 7'6", uh, um, but the design of it is a whole different, um, uh, a totally different, 
the board behaves much different than an average surfboard. And I want to get Bill's uh, reflection on I know my reflection on it. In the preliminary testing, the remarks that I've gotten unsolicited in the water was guys that looked over and said, that board really accelerates off the bottom. So I think that it has merit, but it remains to be seen. Uh, the design could be that on a larger wave, it just won't hold and it just will skip out without holding. Um, but I'm really anxious to, uh, it's my first prototype and I do plan on doing a, uh, but the most rewarding thing is because I love surfing that I've designed something, whether it works or whether it's a wall hanger. Uh, I've designed it and uh, hopefully some merit will uh, come out of this board. I grew up in an era when you flowed with the wave and you flowed with the motion of it and you made more of a thing, uh, you were working with the water instead of ripping it apart. I realize it takes a lot of skill and maybe someday I'll even get there. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's the, uh, the biggest change I think I've seen is in the style of surfing more than anything. My favorite spots today, it moves around a lot, but recently I would have to say it's the Inlet, Assateague are definitely my two favorite spots. Recently because of a good break on 37th Street, I've been surfing there. But one of my favorite things to do is to throw my surfboards in my skiff and head down Assateague and just pick the best break that I see going down either at the airport or even on down farther. To me, that's a real surfing adventure. Uh, from the time we started surfing on 18th Street, everybody always came to my place because I would put together all the things for the cookout, the burgers, the chicken, the beer. Um, I always had a strong work ethic, so I was the guy, you know, even though I was 19, 20, 22, 21 years old, that had the bucks to be able to put something on back then. Then I had a townhouse on 9th Street, and um, uh, we would mix up the big barrels of jungle juice and I knew how to put the music together and I had, we just had tremendously fun and successful parties. They were a lot of fun. Yes, but uh, I, I gra in my mid-30s I graduated out of that. I just turned around and I said, you know, partying was fun and it was a part of my life. I said, but if I want to continue to surf, I really can't be a party animal, and I set partying aside. What surfing does, whether they haven't surfed in 20 years, 10 years, or they surf a little bit now and then, it gives an opportunity to recapture a lifestyle that we once had, that total feeling of freedom. In other words, in today's constraints of business and so forth, you don't really have it. But to these people, and for myself, when I go surfing for just even a half hour in the morning, it's that feeling of freedom. And that's just a big part of surfing. And that's, it's like a, a rush is the only way that I can, uh, the only way I can put it.